Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. That is at Bomani underscore Jones. Rest in peace to the homie prodigy, by the way. We'll talk more about P a little bit later in the show, but I figured I should start there before we get to all this NBA action. It is fantastic, and I believe that people believe it to be more fantastic than the playoffs actually were, in part because I feel like we relate a little more to all the shuffling and the moves and everything else, right? Like, in a way, we feel like we could come up with these trades and these deals and everything else, and we get so excited just at the prospect that somebody wants to be traded, right? Or the prospect that somebody says they're not going to sign and thinking about teams and all the shuffling they do with the cap space and everything else to bring a dude in, and now we got this new one. So we knew Paul George wanted to get out of Indiana. I guess we've known that for a while. We knew Paul George wanted to go to Los Angeles. I guess we knew that for a while. Now the Lakers are making efforts, according to Ramona Shelburne and Mark Stein of this company here called ESPN, that they are making efforts to acquire Paul George because since Paul George became available, all of a sudden a rental market popped up for Paul George that we typically don't think exists, right? You're not, not a lot of people willing to make moves to get like just a just to get one year of Paul George. You see that sort of thing in baseball. You don't really see that sort of thing in basketball, except you got this situation in Cleveland with a certain level of panic because of the Warriors, and they don't know how much longer LeBron is going to stay there. So all of a sudden, the rental Paul George market feels just a little bit different, right? It feels like there are teams that would be willing to jump up to get Paul George for a year. But see, then if you jump up and you get Paul George for a year, then all of a sudden you got to wonder, man, you think Paul George might stick around there? Let's think about guys in history that we thought would not um, stay somewhere and then wind up doing so. Darren Williams, I think, is perhaps the most recent example. Give it a year and a half with the Nets, of all people. He decided he was going to stick around. Uh, The rules are different now than they were back then, but the grandest example is Chris Webber, whom none of us thought was going to stay in Sacramento when he wound up there, and then they informed him that you could get to L.A. on a flight in half an hour, and then boom, suddenly Chris Webber was like, okay, I can make this Sacramento Kings thing work, and I'm going to be on that plane like basically every time we got a day off. Like Chris Webber was commuting to Los Angeles. like It was basically like he was commuting to Los Angeles. I would have loved to have known his freaking flyer miles in that situation. But that becomes the concern. If a team gets Paul George, could they somehow convince him that a winning culture, say Boston, for example, right? Could they somehow convince him that being around some winners is enough of a reason for him to stay? And, I mean, I hear you, except Paul George wanted to go to the Lakers knowing they were sorry. Like, Lakers sorry right now. Lakers probably going to be sorry next year. Paul George is like, hey, man, let me go down there and roll with them sorry dudes. So now the Lakers are apparently now actively in these discussions about making a trade for Paul George. Now, I'd be curious to know just how much the Lakers would be willing to give up because they're not going to give up the number two pick. They're not going to give up Brandon Ingram. Like, these are two things that we know. Those are the guys that they're willing to keep. That, by the way, means by extension that they will give up D'Angelo Russell. They will give up Julius Randle. And I imagine Julius Randle's the first dude they're offering up in any trade because his contract's up at the end of the year, and they're probably not going to be willing to pay what it takes to keep Julius Randle. So, yeah, you get Julius Randle in any trade. Uh, D'Angelo Russell, the thing for him in this situation is we got a draft where people are talking about maybe eight of the first ten picks might be point guard. There are point guards to be had in the draft. If there are point guards in this draft to be had, then the Lakers got one point guard too many, assuming you think D'Angelo Russell is a point guard. So, like, do you give up D'Angelo Russell to get Paul George? Of course you do. And you give up D'Angelo Russell to get Paul George because I can go get another D'Angelo Russell on Thursday, right? Like on Thursday, they're like, yo, D'Angelo Russell, we got like five of those. You want one? We got one. And I'm one that's been pretty optimistic about D'Angelo Russell, and I think he's going to wind up being pretty good. But if you can get Paul George, D'Angelo Russell, man, you put a stamp on his keys and you stuff him in the mailbox. Get insurance if you got to just to make sure. But he got to go. Like, I don't think the Lakers have much choice after everybody else decides that they're going to jump up. The argument is, well, he's going to come here and play for us anyway at the end of the year. And I imagine that Magic Johnson's had to get talked off of that one, right? Because Magic got to be like, what we got to jump for? He want to come play for us. Which, yeah, kind of. If y'all want Paul George, I better hurry up and go over there and get Paul George. And it sounds like they are going to go and get Paul George. 
here's an angle of them going to get Paul George that we really hadn't talked that much about. That would be another star player going to play in the West. Where do guys want to play in the East? Is there anywhere in the East that dudes want to play? Because, I mean, it's just a straight talent drain from the East to West that you wind up with there, right? If Paul George goes from Indiana and winds up going over to the Lakers, look, the Lakers don't even become a championship contender under that circumstance. It's just another player going to the West. It's like the West is just warehousing dudes. Now, here's our man Tom Penn. He was on uh, the six with Mike and Jamel. And here's what he said about the Lakers and what he thinks about what they should do with regards to Paul George. I think it's time to just go get him. He says he wants to be there. Why wait? Why go through another year of the doldrums? We talk about the assets they have. What do they really have? What are you really excited about there, other than the number two pick now? I hope they're a little bit excited about Brandon Ingram, right? Or that, maybe. Maybe. to an extent, yeah. maybe. Still? To an extent, maybe. I don't know. Okay, maybe. <laughs> you want to build the Lakers on maybe? Or do you want to go get Paul George, who's the real deal? He makes a good point there, which is we are fascinated with this idea of assets, right? Like, we love – that is the buzzword to use is assets. We love talking about how teams stack up all these assets. So, like, we talked about the Sixers for the longest. The Sixers had all these assets, but the question was, when were you going to convert them into, like, an asset you could use? You know what I mean? Like, not all assets are the same, right? So they got all these assets. It's like, okay, cool, you got a brick of gold. Brick of gold is an asset. You can't walk in the store and buy nothing with a brick of gold, though, right? You got to turn it into cash at some point. At what point are you going to turn it into cash? You know what these assets sound like? Shannon, you ever have anybody when you were little buy you savings bonds? I did, actually. All right. Did you, was your mom the one holding on to them savings bonds? I don't know where they are now. Okay, because here's the thing that would always happen. I'm going to talk to my mom about, you You know, I got these savings bonds. Maybe we can sell those. No, no, no. We're going to keep those savings bonds. How many people ever actually cash in the savings bond? Right? Like, you always get the savings bond, and you just hold on to it. Why? Because it's an asset. To that point, I know we have them. I, right. I should say, I know my mother has them. I just don't know where right, they are. Right, right, right. Like, I got a couple savings bonds for somewhere for all. I know they're worth $3 million, right? But you always like, I got the savings bond. Well, hold on to that thing. It's going to be worth some money. But it ain't money right now, and I need money, right? Go take that $50 bond in there and give me some cash so they don't cut off these lights, right? A lot of teams, I feel like, are in this place where we're always, it's so romantic to talk about what the assets are. Top pin hit it right there. Yo, man, why don't you go turn it into the real deal? Like, Paul George isn't a what if. So, like, the Sixers had those assets, and then they turned them pr- presumably into Markel Fultz. Markel Fultz is still a what if, right? Like, we don't really know what this Markel Fultz thing is going to be. We got a great idea of what this Paul George thing is going to be. So, yeah, Paul George isn't going to be enough to push the Lakers to the point of winning a championship. But if you got a chance to get Paul George, I feel like you put a stamp on that what if and say whatever. So, like the Lakers say, they're not willing to get rid of the number two pick. I understand why you're saying you're not willing to get rid of the number two pick. But the same way you can keep the number two pick and get rid of D'Angelo Russell, I feel like you can keep D'Angelo Russell and get rid of the number two pick if it's going to get you Paul George. Right? Like, whatever player you get with the number two pick, how likely is it that that player is going to turn out to be as good as Paul George? Right? Like, you're getting Paul George in prime. Paul George has been in the league, what, seven years? Then he came in in 2010. The player that you're going to get, how likely is it that you're going to get something out of him that approaches having Paul George in his prime? If they want the number two pick, I give them the number two pick. If they want Ingram, you can have Ingram. Like, I cannot understand the idea that we're going to hold on to Brandon Ingram that type if it puts us in a position to where we're going to lose Paul George. Now, maybe what you say is we want to keep Ingram because we think we can get Paul George at the end of the year, and Ingram is too risky given this option to getting Paul George at the end of the year. All right, maybe, right? Like, maybe you'll entertain that one. Like, I feel like if Paul George goes to Cleveland, he's still going to wind up going to Los Angeles. Because if a man had his heart set on going to Los Angeles, Cleveland ain't no substitute. I don't give a damn if they win a championship or not. If you got your heart set on L.A., New York doesn't quite work, let alone no damn Cleveland. I don't understand, though, in regards to Ingram. Don't Ingram and George play the same position? So if you're so willing to hold on to Ingram, he's going to be coming off the bench, right? Well, is Paul George willing to play more power forward, which he was not willing to do? in um, Indiana? So maybe that's the—I don't know. 
well, I don't know because all of this is what if. And I feel like the Lakers feel very encouraged by what they saw from Brandon Ingram last year. Um, I don't feel encouraged by what I saw from Brandon Ingram last year because I wasn't staying up late to watch the damn Lakers and neither were you. Right? Like, like it, like it, 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 nah, nah, nah. It wasn't. Nope, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. So, like, maybe this is what it is. Like, maybe they, they are that excited and it's legitimate. I just can't say, no, we're not trading Brandon Ingram if on the other side of that is Paul George. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Give us a call. Coming up next, is Jimmy Butler better look for the Cavs than Paul George? We'll talk about that on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM Channel 8. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Benny Goodwill of Comcast Sports Chicago will join us next segment. Benny Goodwill will join us at 4.30. Talk about where the Bulls are with Jimmy Butler. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. And hey, Top Straight Talk. Brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones. Best networks. No contract. So, yes, uh, we talked a little bit last segment about the Lakers and Paul George. And, look, if the Lakers want Paul George, you got to go ahead and make a move for Paul George. Also, I mean, the, the Lakers don't have that much worth keeping. Like, I don't feel bad about what the Lakers have there. Like, Clarkson, I think, is good. I think the Russell is good. I think Randall's all right. I think Ingram's decent. But they don't have anybody that you just can't part with, right? Like, they don't have a, a Greek freak on that roster, right? Like, there's not an Anthony Davis or something like that. Like, just a guy where you're just like, oh, no, 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 no. Under no circumstances, we'd be willing to part with those dudes. They got a whole bunch of cats I'd listen to, listen about. Every single one of them I would be willing to listen. And I think the Lakers look around and realize, hey, man, if Cleveland's willing to play the rental game, then we probably going to have to step this up to make sure that we get Paul George. I also think, by the way, for the Lakers, something that can't be lost is they ain't never been sorry for this long in a row, ever. Ever. Right. So like this idea that, you know, the Sixers thing, we're just going to bottom out and keep stacking this until we figure out how to make it. That's not the only way to do this. Like you can figure out how to get good once you have Paul George on the team and make some other moves. And they are the Lakers. I think that people will want to sign with them. Hell, Paul George wants to sign with them. But I think the Lakers look around and they just like, look, this ain't worth the risk. We got some guys that we could get, you know, that we're willing to part with. Let's just go ahead and make this happen. Get Paul George in here and then we'll work the rest out. Right. I think Cleveland winds up being the party that really helps to push this market because their existence makes it to where the Lakers are no longer bidding against themselves. It makes it far more likely that the Pacers can get something close to value for Paul George because the truth is when you trade a dude as good as Paul George, you're not going to get value. You're just not. I mean, that's not how it works. You're not going to get value for a dude that good. By and large, in the NBA, it's hard to win a trade if you don't get the best player. Even if you win a trade where you didn't get the best player, you're just making the best of what you can do. Like That's that's how that winds up going. Now, we look now at the Bulls, because the Bulls have Jimmy Butler. If you're going to move Jimmy Butler, now might be the time to see what is going on around you in this market. And now we're starting to hear more and more whispers that the Cavs are trying to see what's up with Jimmy Butler, right? It'll take a third team in all likelihood to make this happen because the Bulls will need a pick in order to make that, you know, make that work. But now they're trying to make the press to go and get Jimmy Butler. And I think Jimmy Butler's a better look for the Bulls than the Cavs. Number one, are we sure that Paul George is down to be somebody's sidekick? And I'm not saying that Jimmy Butler is necessarily down to be somebody's sidekick, but Jimmy Butler got a lot of game recognized game in him. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like Jimmy Butler's like, look, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to ball hard, right? Is he going to be the one that wants to put up with LeBron and all that stuff that LeBron talked? Probably not. But is LeBron going to have to talk that same noise that Jimmy Butler? He got to talk to these other dudes? Probably not, right? But Paul George, I think if we learned anything about Paul George this last postseason, Paul George sees himself as the ace. Right, He sees himself as numero uno. He sees himself as the dude who should be leading this. Even for a year, you think he's trying to be out here riding shotgun to LeBron? Because he will be riding shotgun to LeBron. You think that's what he's trying to do? How Paul George going to take it when he's not getting that last shot because it's LeBron? Or will he like it because LeBron decides to give him that shot? Or when Kyrie is like, you want the ball, you need to come get it. How does this go, Right. I just feel like Jimmy Butler is a little bit easier on the plug and play. I also feel like the Cavs need somebody who can be a playmaker, right? Somebody who can initiate the offense. Jimmy Butler could be a playmaker to initiate the offense. The Cavs also need a two. They badly need a two. 
Jimmy Butler winds up being that shooting guard. The Cavs are already over-invested in the front court, right? So you get one of those front court guys out of there, whether it be Thompson or Kevin Love. Maybe you find another guy to go there. Who knows? Maybe your move is use Kyrie to try to get one of those dudes, use Kevin Love to try to get the other one, right? Like, maybe that's the game plan that you use. I mean, my, my man Nate Jones said this on Twitter. Make the core Paul George, Jimmy Butler, and LeBron James instead of the core being Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, and Kevin Love. Like, look, the Cavs, I feel like they got to approach this as though LeBron's only going to be there for one more year. It's maxed it out. Like, you know what it looks like in Cleveland when LeBron isn't there anymore. It looks all bad, right? Like, is this the time to max it out? Not to mention that we're starting to hear rumors that Kyrie inter- Kyrie Irving's not very much interested in staying in Cleveland when Lebr- <laughs> if and when LeBron goes. Well, let us not forget, Kyrie remembers what it was like before LeBron got there. Like, he might not have been so happy with how it went at first after LeBron got there, but Kyrie, he remembers what it was like. And it's funny because I saw McMenamin on Sports Center the other day, and McMenamin was saying that there's a lot of people in Cleveland who believe that they have developed a championship culture. And they feel like what they have is something that guys will get into and guys will want to be a part of. And once they get a taste of it, like if they took Paul George on a rental, they feel like Paul George would get a taste of what they got there in Cleveland. And that'll make him want to say, stay because of that championship culture. I'm like, you ain't got no championship culture. You got LeBron. Hey, the second LeBron left last time, y'all ain't had no damn championship culture. What are you talking about? You are ch- no, you got LeBron. And if LeBron walks out the door, Kyrie's like, no, 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 I sink this. I, I sink this movie before. And he's like, I want to be traded. The Cavs be like, yeah, people of hell want ice water. I bet you do want to be traded. <laughs> Why'd you get out here and get these buckets? Why, why are you so worried, Kyrie? You already got a ring. Now it's all the buckets in the world for you to get. <laughs> Kyrie on that team without LeBron might score 45 points a game and three assists. Okay, two. To an impossible. Yeah, yeah, it's going to come down to a judgment call from the scores table. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Talk to Coach Francis. What's going on, man? Hey, Bill, I was listening to the show as usual, and you had mentioned Anthony Davis' name, and that just sparked an uh, interest in me to call in because I was talking to another coach today, and uh, we were thinking about a package to Boston to put together some draft picks, some number one draft picks, uh, maybe a couple of players, and get Anthony Davis for the middle. Uh, what do you think? And I'll hang up and listen. Well, I appreciate the call, man. Um so here's my thought on Anthony Davis. I was thinking about this riding in today. Anthony Davis signed his first extension with the Pelicans. Everybody signs the first extension. The second extension is where it gets weird, right? And so how many guys that are anywhere near the stature of Anthony Davis have signed the second extension with the team who drafted them if that team had not been in any level of championship contention, right? Let's think about this. LeBron, I mean, and this really starts like after the 2010 season is where this thing really gets going. LeBron signed the first extension, did not sign the second extension. Dwight Howard signed the first extension, was not looking to sign the second extension with Orlando. Um, I mean, keep going up and down the line. Kevin Durant signed the first extension, did not sign the second extension. Russell Westbrook did sign the second extension, but even then he only signed that for like a two-year extension. Guys typically don't sign the second extension. If you're the Pelicans, I mean, you got uh, DeMarcus Cousins now. So now that you have him, you have to see how this thing goes with Anthony Davis. However, how likely is it that Anthony Davis is going to sign the second extension in New Orleans? And if he's not likely to sign the second extension in New Orleans, why wait? Why not try to get the most you can for Anthony Davis? All right. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk to Benny Goodwill of Comcast Sports Chicago. Where are the Bulls now with Jimmy Butler and his future? You listen to ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Series XM Channel 80. We've been talking a lot about Upside.com, telling you it will save you or your company big on business travel and that you'll get a big gift card every trip you buy. Sounds too good to be true, right? Go to Upside.com and check it out. Super fast searches, by the way. For instance, in less than two minutes, you could have a few awesome choices on American Airlines flights to Chicago at the end of next month that work for you and a bunch of big-name hotels. Your options could get you a $268 gift card and save your company $268. Taking a business trip? You'd be crazy not to use Upside. Spend less of your company's money and get more rewards for yourself. Upside's the real deal. You may wind up with a $268 gift card. 
Trust me, go to Upside.com today. Plus, when you use promo code BOMANI, you're guaranteed to get at least a $100 Amazon gift card your first trip. That's code BOMANI to get a $100 gift card free. Say big on traveling, get a big gift card every trip. See what your next trip's worth today. Upside.com. That's Upside.com. Minimum purchase required. See site for complete details. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line, just like our next guest. He covers the Bulls for CSN Chicago. His name is Vinny Goodwill. All right, Vinny, um, all of a sudden the Cavs are calling to talk about Jimmy Butler. We're all r- wondering what in the world is going on here. What do you have? Uh, not only are the Cavs calling, the Bulls are calling Celtics. The Suns are calling the Bulls. The Denver Nuggets have called the Bulls in the past. I think the Bulls have almost caught everybody in the top six from from everything that I've not been able to understand. The Bulls want to get in this draft, and I think they're ready to finally make a deal and trade Jimmy Butler and, and start their rebuilding process. They want to get in this draft and get one of these uh, young players, what, what was it, six or seven guys that they say can be uh, all-star caliber players. It seems like the Bulls are ready to try to get in on that. Well, what's it going to take for them to get into the top six? Because the Cavs can't do that by themselves, for example. That's what makes this tricky. Like, not only do the Cavs can't do this by themselves, who's running the Cavs right now? I don't know. Is it Chauncey Billups? Is it Dan Gilbert? Is it – I don't know. Like, and so who are you talking to if you're the Bulls? And who has this level of sophistication that's needed to go grab a third team, to recruit a third team in there and figure out whether that team is going to take Kevin Love or Kyrie Irving is going to be on the table. The fact that this has happened two days before the draft, this, just re- this basically reinforces the fact that the NBA is, like, really silly season. Like, this is insane. All right, we're talking to Vinny Goodwill of CSN Chicago on the right time. So if you had to guess right now, what percentage chance would you put on Jimmy Butler being a bull on opening night? Any number lower than zero? <laughs> like I don't, I don't think it's that low. But I, I think right around this time yesterday, Bomani, I started receiving a bunch of texts from people around the league saying it's real this time. Like it's not just a lot of smoke; that it's actually fire. That the Bulls are the ones doing the shopping. Before the Bulls would be sitting around, they would take calls. They would sit and listen to Orlando, to Boston, to Denver, to whomever wanted to make overtures. And because they never took Jimmy off the market. Now, from everything I've understood, the Bulls are the ones making the calls. The Bulls are the ones being active. It seems like they've just made a decision to say, you know what? For this Fred Hoiberg thing to work, Jimmy Butler can't be here. And because Jimmy Butler has one more season where if he makes an all-NBA team, he can make that super max money, we don't want to pay a guy for $40 million a year to be on a team that we're not sure can be built to be a contender while Jimmy Butler is still in his prime. All right, talking to Vinny Goodwill of CS in Chicago. Now you say to make the Fred Ho- make the Fred Hoiberg thing work, the Bulls might think Jimmy has to go. Why would he have to go to make it work? Because their relationship is just not it, it, it's just not good. It's, it's been bad basically since day one. It, it, it showed signs one would think of improvement last year, but Jimmy Butler's frustration with Fred Hoiberg and Hoiberg's inability to be strong with the young players, to have accountability, and, and just Jimmy Butler feeling like he needs to be coached a certain way. And that's just not the way that Fred Hoiberg kicks. And the Bulls have not presented the, the requisite roster around Hoiberg to sort of accentuate his strengths. So when you have a coach that your best player doesn't believe in and you have a coach who doesn't have the players that can best fit his system, it's a bad fix. And when you talk about a coach who hasn't necessarily presented the strongest image of someone deserving of that high level of respect, and he's going into year three, at some point the organization was going to have to make a choice. Now, for me, usually the coach usually doesn't get chosen. Usually it's the player. Usually if it's the, best, if it's the player has a higher stating in the league compared to the coach, then the player gets chosen. In this case, the Bulls have a lot invested in Fred Hoiberg, and they want this to work, and they're trying not to have this be another coaching mistake and pay another coach off because they've had to fire him. So they're trying to make this work, and unfortunately for Jimmy Butler, it appears he's going to be the casualty of that. Well, what does Jimmy Butler want? Jimmy Butler wants to stay. You know, as 
strange as it is, like this is not the Paul George thing, Bomani. This is not him going to the Bulls and saying, hey, I want out. Here's where I'm going to go and, and get rid of me. A, he has an extra year left on his contract. B, he loves Chicago. He loves the media market. He loves the fact that he's a Jordan guy and he's playing for Michael Jordan's franchise. Like that means something to him. He just wants the franchise to get his act together. And unfortunately, he and the franchise have not been on the same page since he's basically become the guy in charge. And don't, make no mistake about it, Jimmy Butler likes being the guy in charge in Chicago. There's a lot of value for him in that, but he doesn't want to go as frustrated as he is with the front office, as frustrated as he is with Fred Hoiberg and some of the things and decisions that have been made. He still likes it here. He wants to succeed here because this is the franchise that drafted him, gave him a chance, allowed him to grow, but it just doesn't appear that that's happening here. And I actually, he's going to sit down with Dwayne Wade over the next two days in Paris. And Dwayne, from what I understand, is going to pick his brain. And I'm sure Dwayne is probably going to have, tell Jimmy to have a, you know, a come to Jesus moment to say, hey, look, if they're going to trade you, you have power here now. You can sort of pick, figure out where you want to go and how you want this to end as opposed to believing that you should stay and you want to stay. Once you get it out of your head that you're going somewhere, then you start turning the page and you start looking at your options. Well, speaking of Dwayne Wade in this, we're hearing that he's going to pick up his $25 million option. How's that going to go with him being on this team that's going nowhere? It's going to test his patience and his sanity because he's picking up that option. He, he is going to secure, as the kids say, the bag. <laughs> he has worked very hard to secure the bag, and I don't think that Jimmy Butler's presence or non-presence, as close as they are, I don't think that Jimmy Butler's presence is going to determine whether Dwayne Wade chooses to opt in or out. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Dwayne Wade will necessarily stay the entire season as a bull, but it means that he will at least, in my opinion, make sure that he gets this $23.8 million next season because he doesn't know how long he's going to play. And he knows if he enters the free agent market, it, it's, it's not a, a good bet that he'll get a $20 million contract or even an $18 million contract at his age. He wants to make sure he has the money and he'll figure out everything else on the back end. All right, last question for Vinny Goodwill of CS in Chicago. Um, how would you see it going for Jimmy Butler riding shotgun to LeBron James, hypothetically? Like, is he built for that? Well, I think he he is in a way because you got to think this is not a guy who's been the guy for his whole basketball career. Like he's been underrated and overlooked and all that stuff, so he's used to being an afterthought. The problem is, as I just said, Jimmy has grown to love being the man in charge in Chicago. So, But if you're, if you're going to go play next to a guy like LeBron, like you're going to have to subjugate your ego for the sake of winning, at least for a little while. I mean, let's let's think about this here. I'm not the only person who's heard about LeBron James' future not being in Cleveland, correct? Right. If that's the case, then how long does he have to play next to LeBron James if he only has to do it for a year? And then that particular team can be his own. Why wouldn't he embrace that for a year and then try to figure stuff out for the rest of his career? Doing it for one year and you're playing behind the best player on the planet, compared to having nightmares, worrying about guarding them, that, that might not necessarily be the worst thing in the world. I'll say this. He'd probably rather be in Cleveland than in Boston. All Sorry, right. Boston. <laughs> That's Vinny Goodwill. Check him out on CSN Chicago, covering the Chicago Bulls. Thanks so much, my man. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, now ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. We'll compare rates for you so you get the best deal, even if it's not with us saving you time and money. Now, that's Progressive. Call or click today. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Pencil Performance Line. Thanks to Vinny Goodwill of CSN Chicago for joining us last segment. Ian Begley of ESPN will join us in the 5 o'clock Eastern Hour to talk about the madness of the New York Knicks. Nothing makes a summer birthday or anniversary more magical than 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only $29.99, you'll get another dozen plus a vase absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. All right, eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. That is our telephone number. Uh, we were talking about last segment about um, Jimmy Butler and what's going on with him 
and the Bulls. And uh, Vinny Goodwill of Comcast made a good point. He says, look, man, one thing about Jimmy is Jimmy has come to like being the man. He likes being the man everything centers around in Chicago. How's that go if he winds up on another one of these teams where he's no longer the best player? Like, I don't know if you can win a championship necessarily with Jimmy Butler being the best player on your team. I do know, however, that after you get used to being the best player on your team, you might decide that you want to keep being in a situation where you're the best player on the team because for a lot of people to feel good to be the man, right? Like Kevin Durant going to Golden State being like, hey, here's a situation where I might not be the man, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Not everybody's like that. That's not what everybody is in this for. And Jimmy Butler is quite possibly one of those people who wants to be the man. If that's the case, if you're Cleveland, for example, how does that factor into your decision to trade him? Because, look, I can't imagine what that tension is going to be where they got one year to try to get this thing here figured out. But this is going to be a new way, I think, that we look at a lot of our superstars where very often we want the guy that's the alpha, right? We want the guy who wants to take the last shot. At least that's the way that we tell the story. But Only one guy could be the alpha on each team, right? Only one person can be in charge on all of these squads. And to win a championship, you need a guy who's good enough to be in charge on his squad who, you know, isn't going to be in charge. And how do you determine who that is? How do you determine who's built for that? Because you're lucky you can get one of those guys through the draft, right? Because then the relationships and everything else, they kind of – they separate themselves. Like you get to a point of equilibrium just through the development of the team that you happen to have. But how does that go when you talk about bringing these dudes in after they already established? Like this is the same question with Paul George. When you talk about him going to Cleveland, Hey man, them Gatorade commercials ain't got Paul George standing in the corner, waiting on LeBron and tell him what to do. Right. You know, he wants to be the guy to take those shots. How much are you willing to trade? Right. What do you have to receive in order to, to give up being the guy who takes those shots, that's just going to be a whole new way. We look at so many of these dudes now where for so long we've been like, yeah, you need somebody who wants that shot. Now you're going to have to have, okay, we want somebody who kind of wants that shot but is willing to not take that shot from time to time. And how exactly do you figure that out? Because that's something right now that the Cavs got to figure out on the fly if they're talking about making these moves and maybe getting Paul George and maybe getting Jimmy Butler. How's it work? 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. It defaults out to Tyler in Toronto. Tyler, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, Bomani, uh, first-time listener. Love your show. Uh, I just want to talk about uh, Paul George going to the Lakers. And if I was Magic, I would probably send Julius Randle and the, uh, the, uh, what's his name? The, the Their second pick last year. Yeah. I would ship them right to the Pacers, get Paul George, and what? He stays for a year because he wants to be in Los Angeles. You know, he's definitely going to want to stay longer and then start uh, start building a franchise from there. All right. Your input is greatly appreciated, Tyler. Shannon, you got anything? Sound good to me. I'm sure Magic's right on that right away. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. So much going on with Cleveland, by the way. So much. We're going to talk more about that next segment. By the way, we got a poll here on the ESPN uh, Radio Twitter account. It's at ESPN Radio. Uh, about four players, which of them is going? Which of them is most likely to be on a different team next season? Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Chris Ass Porzingis, or Kevin Love? Go ahead and throw your votes in on that one. 888-729-3776. Let's talk to Jacob in Texas. Jacob, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, what's going on, Bo? Love you, man. Right? Love listening to your show. Uh, if I was the Lakers, if I was Magic, I would just calm down and just wait for Paul George next year. If he keeps saying he's going to come, just let him ride by. Let him go on a rental for next year. He gets a ring, he gets a ring. I don't think he'll stay in Cleveland if he does go to Cleveland. I don't want to yeah. give up too much for him. Yeah, but here's the thing, Jacob, and I appreciate the call. You saying that from the crib. If you don't get Paul George, you'll just get your mind to some new optimistic place and then go from there. These cats actually work for the Lakers. Like, ain't no just, oh, well, we didn't get Paul George. If they if they had a chance to get Paul George and they missed out on Paul George, nobody there is forgiving themselves anytime soon because they don't have the pick next year, right? Like, the pick goes to the Sixers next year. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Like, this is it. Like, this feels like the chance. I guess I'm on the other side. I'd be willing to give up the number two pick. Not to mention, if you're the Lakers, you have enough young players now. Like, how many more young players do you need? It's it's time now to put those young players with a bona fide star. Yeah, like, after a certain point, you reach critical mass on children, right? Like, you just reach a point where we got enough young dudes. Like, the Wizards wound up at that point. They just finally looked up like, yeah, we're not good, but we got to start getting grown-ups. 
And I think it's worked out well for them. Like, you want to win a championship, but it's not like everything below a championship is just not worth having, right? Like, if you're a Wizards fan, this isn't a bad time to root for your team. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. Coming up next, the Cavs may be hiring Chauncey Billups and let their general manager go. The hell are they doing, man? Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.